This movie is going to put a lot of kids at greater risk to be sexually molested by someone they know and their family knows when there is just very little risk of being uh, abducted and whisked away and put in a brothel and being sold for sex. Jennifer Harker Limones, who has been an advocate for victims, she writes, the stranger danger hype from the 80s and 90s. She writes, I grew up believing that the stranger danger hype was the biggest threat, when in fact the biggest threat was attending church with me on Sundays. And that's the point. I think that's the response to people who say, stop attacking Tim Ballard and OUR. Any awareness is good. Any advocacy is good. Any good that anyone does needs to be promoted. And I would just say, not if it takes our eye or our money or our time or attention away from the real abuse stories that are happening in our churches, in our Boy Scout troops, in our communities, in our families, right under our nose. We right. mentioned this earlier. If these uh, OUR Tim Ballard movies get us to think that abuse is happening over there, exactly. and that all we've got to do is give a bunch of money so that someone else can go take care of the problem that's happening over there in Honduras or Dominican Republic or Nicaragua or Haiti. And it makes us be less vigilant about asking the Catholic Church and the Mormon Church and the Boy Scouts of America to create systems to protect our children, our neighbors, our friends, our family, then there actually is harm that's being done because our attention, our money, our resources are being redirected away from the real significant imminent threats right in front of us. Tim Ballard is a, uh, is a member of the Mormon church. And we all know that the Mormon church, along with its law firm at Kurt McConkie and its lobbyists, have explicitly lobbied in states like Utah and in states like Arizona to make it so their bishops, their stake presidents, their mission presidents are not mandatory reporters to the police, to social services, when they discover that ward members or stake members or missionaries are abusing children. And so the Mormon church literally actively fights to prevent uh, child abusers, pedophiles, and even uh, human traffickers from being reported to the police and from being processed through the criminal justice system. And what I want to do is I want to highlight that, highlight that to Tim Ballard and to anyone else who stands up and says they're against the abuse of children if you want to make a difference, Tim Ballard, in protecting children like Sam Young did, like Sam Young did getting excommunicated by the Mormon church for trying to protect children. If you, Tim Ballard, want to truly protect children, one excellent place to start is to call out the abuse that's happening within the Mormon church and to call out uh, Mormon church leadership and Kurt McConkie leadership in um, keeping the Mormon church and its leaders from reporting abuse and abusers to law enforcement officials. You, Tim Ballard, could call out the Mormon church and do more than anyone to protect tens of thousands of children within the Mormon church. And again, if you want to expand that, you could call out the Catholic Church and uh, evangelical Christianity for all that they do to prevent um, uh, child abusers from being reported to authorities and to police and all they do to protect abusers at the expense of victims. That's my little rant today because I think that one of the biggest costs, one of the negative costs of Tim Ballard, O-U-R, and of this movie, Sound of Freedom, is that it takes our attention away from the abuse that's happening right under our noses in the Mormon church and the Catholic church and the evangelical church by clergy and by members of the church in good standing. It takes our attention away from that very prevalent abuse, uh, abuse and it redirects our attention to fictitious abuse of kidnapping, 
and trafficking that is very rare that is allegedly happening overseas that probably is happening on some level, but not in any way to the prevalence that Tim Ballard and OUR are claiming. And certainly, um, you know, not being resolved or addressed or fixed um, and the victim's uh, care being addressed in any way like Tim Ballard and OUR have claimed that they've been addressing and helping in these paramilitary jumps and in the aftercare programs that um, apparently are, are not doing the job that many of the donors think they're doing. So that's my rant. I hope that makes sense. I hope uh, that we will all do our part to fight abuse, to fight sexual abuse, to fight pedophilia, to fight human trafficking, but do it in ways that uh, really, really impact positively and that take care of the victims. Would you mind just taking us through how Tim Ballard and OUR's efforts might step-by-step step create the problem that they claim to be fighting, just so that people really understand how that would work? Right. And again, this is not a matter of our opinion. This is a concern raised to us primarily by former OUR operators who worked in uh, the military and intelligence spaces. So people who really know what they're doing when it comes to this kind of investigation. Um, the concern that they had was that when an organization like OUR or other organizations that follow what's called the raid and rescue model go into situations without adequate intelligence um, and they are not breaking up existing trafficking rings. So for instance, if you go into a bar or a sex club and you say, you know, um, we're, you know, we're looking for uh, young girls. No, we want them younger. No, we want them younger. You're not necessarily finding a trafficking ring that way. What you're doing is creating a perception that there is money to be made if someone brings you those children, right? Um, so the concern, again, from the you know former military and former intelligence people that we talked to who had been uh, involved with OUR was that they were not finding trafficking rings, that they were instead sort of creating potentially demand. That was, that was their concern. That was something that they brought up to us, again, uh, because when you're doing this kind of work, you want to make really sure that what you're doing is finding actual trafficking rings and bringing those to local authorities. Because again, even if OUR was able to find, you know, um, what they believe to be an actual trafficking ring, they have to involve local authorities. You know, these are countries that have their own rules and laws. This is not the Wild West. Tim Ballard can't, you know, as depicted in the movie, um, kill a trafficker with his bare hands. Like that wouldn't, that wouldn't be okay, right? Um, so again, when we don't, when they don't follow, you know, allegedly like patterns of careful sort of investigation and intelligence gathering, the concern is that they're not actually finding trafficking rings. So that's something that's been brought up to us again and again and again. Does that, does that imply that they're bringing money to pay people to come up with victims? Is that part of what's implied then or, or alleged? There's one, there's at least one account by somebody who went on one of these operations of paying a trafficker, negotiating with a trafficker, a price for a child. I think it ended up being $30,000. Um, and it's even, it's even central to the plot of the movie, which for a variety of reasons, um, you know, you don't want to take too seriously. It's fictional, but the, the engine of the movie is, is the character Jim Caviezel is playing as Tim Ballard going to traffickers and, and they say, I can't come up with that many children. And him saying, I want at least 50 children. I want as many children as you can get. Um, so we know that, you know, there have been there have been cases of them just paying for children, at least this this one case that a real estate agent uh, who had gone on one of the missions talked about himself. And we know that to the extent that Ballard and OUR had control over the representation of them in the movie, that sort of activity is something that they're comfortable portraying as uh, part of their method. So yeah, it's, you know, I think it's fair to say. I guess the question might be, you Vice News could report on a, a gazillion different topics. If there's a chance that they're doing 25% or 50% of the harm of, of, of the good that they claim, 
what would make you want to even take interest in a story like this, especially if it could potentially do damage to the good heart, to the good things that they do do? And I, you don't have to answer it. I, I'm just curious. I actually think that a good way to answer that is to tell you about one specific story that we looked into that OUR has fundraised off of quite directly and made much of their involvement in that some folks might be familiar with, which is a little girl that OUR calls Liliana. Um, OUR and Mr. Ballard have repeatedly represented themselves as having helped to rescue Liliana when she was trafficked. Um, Mr. Ballard has argued that Liliana's story is an argument for the need for you know, a border wall between the US and Mexico. Uh, he's talked about it with former President Trump, with Ivanka Trump. Um, they made the Liliana story as they represented it really central to OUR's public image. So when we started investigating some of OUR's claims, we found the person that Liliana is based on immediately because of course her traffickers were arrested and brought to trial. And what we found in the trial transcripts is very different than what OUR has represented. Liliana was 14 when she was trafficked uh, by a man that she believed to be her romantic partner and brought to the United States. And when she was 17, after years of being sexually tra trafficked, after years of you know, the worst abuse that anyone can think of, she rescued herself. She escaped herself, uh, which is incredible. The strength that it takes to do that as a, as a teenager is unthinkable, right? Um, and what we discovered is that if OUR has ever worked with Eliana, it is not until years after she was rescued. Uh, rescued herself, not until years after she escaped. Um, OUR misrepresented their involvement in her case, and they seem to have done so to fundraise and to make a case in Mr. Ballard's case for the existence of a border wall. That is not, that is just simply not um, in line with the truth, as we understand it, from court records, from her own testimony. And you could argue that it does a disservice to people like Liliana to misrepresent them, to argue that you know someone else is responsible for their safety and their well-being when in fact they rescued themselves, and that it helps contribute to a false understanding of how trafficking works and of how anti-trafficking work is conducted. Um, the other thing that's important to understand about Liliana is that her case was ultimately brought to trial through a partnership between you know, many different branches of government, many, many, many people who work together to arrest her traffickers and bring them to justice. And so when OUR and Mr. Ballard represent themselves as being you know, her sole saviors, um, you know, not only is that not honest, it also oversimplifies the important work that other people do. And it creates, again, a false sort of binary understanding of how folks can work together to end human trafficking. It makes it sound like it's the work of one man or one organization. And when people think that, it does not empower them to take the action that they could take themselves to help end human trafficking. I think what I think is particularly triggering to me, someone who has raised Mormon about the movie, is the combination of the fact that Tim Ballard as a Mormon and the actor who plays Tim Ballard in the movie as a Catholic, between those two individuals, they represent two of the churches in the United States with some of the most serious allegations of uh, covering up of abuse and of protecting abusers at the expense of victims, whether it's the Catholic Church and, and its spotlight uh, sort of uh, stories that have come out, or, uh, you know, uh, the, the Mormon churches admittedly uh, participation in cover-ups of abuse of Boy Scouts and the Boy Scouts of America. It's just so odd to have a Mormon and a Catholic talking about, you know, a, abuse or harm of children out there when the churches that they advocate for and represent mm -hmm. are some of the worst offenders. One of the most interesting interviews we've ever done in all of our reporting on this was with a uh, self-advocacy group in Thailand who are all sex workers. Um, and the sex workers uh, that we spoke to 
um, who have, you know, been advocating for, you know, better working conditions and better safety in their industry in Thailand for many years, uh, were saying that they had never specifically heard of OUR, which again, it's a little bit striking because OUR claims to have worked in Thailand for many years, but they said that there are many, many, many Western groups from the US, from Australia and from England who all come to Thailand specifically because there's a large sex trade there, um, sort of on the same model, which is claiming to rescue women and children from brothels often by you know, conducting these armed raids. Uh, and then in many cases, ironically, sort of frankly, for lack of a better word, arresting these women and taking them elsewhere and holding them against their will, which is um, by no one's sort of uh, estimation and actual rescue, right? Uh, so the women talked about this being like a very kind of persistent problem in Thailand. Uh, the other thing that they talked about a lot um, that they personally found offensive was the suggestion that anybody working in a brothel in Thailand as an adult would not notice or not be concerned about seeing a child in those spaces. You know, these women who we interviewed stressed to us that they are themselves mothers and would never sort of tolerate seeing a child being sexually exploited, um, which again is sort of a detail that a lot of Western organizations tend to gloss over. They tend to imply that there are countries where everyone is okay with the child sex trade and are looking the other way when in fact, pretty universally among most people on the planet, the idea of children being sexually exploited is disgusting, it is distressing, and it's something that we all want to fight against. So when someone suggests to you, for instance, that no one cares about child sex trafficking except for them, and no one cares about the safety of children, you know, just ask yourself if that has um, the ring of truth. This movie is going to put a lot of kids at greater risk to be sexually molested by someone they know and their family knows when there is just very little risk of being uh, abducted and whisked away and put in a brothel and being sold for sex. And uh, one point I want to make before I forget it is I've asked, and everyone should ask, Tim Ballard, OUR, name one time Okay, they've rescued, what, thousands? They say they've rescued thousands of, of, uh, of uh, child, uh, they call sex slaves, working in brothels or coming to sex parties that they set up. Name one time that you've rescued one person that fits the mold in Sound of Freedom. One time. They're kidnapped. That's step one. And they're, they're taken away and they're sold, uh, either sold to a, a madam uh, or a pimp, or the person who steals them starts selling them for sex. And as Ballard has said so many times, and raped uh, 10, 20 times a night, and billions of dollars come in. And uh, look at the Elizabeth Smart situation, who for a while was with OUR. She fit the first uh, requirement. She was kidnapped. She was gone. They did not know where she went. That's a pure kidnapping. But was it trafficking? No, the kidnapper uh, sexually abused her himself and no money was exchanged. Uh, for, after being a reporter for years, I don't, I don't know of a single instance when somebody has been kidnapped and then pushed into uh, sex slavery. They're really trumping up Tim Ballard's heroics and involvement. And in that way, it's deceptive because he's kind of being being the salesman, the brand. He's being called a hero everywhere he goes. Is this a true story or was any of this embellished for dramatic purposes <laughs> in this? All right. So we did the Count of Monte Cristo by way of analogy. You have... Oh, 1,200 pages, 88 characters. Now, people love this movie. We had to get it down to 100 minutes. So I don't have time to show you 10,000 minutes of the heroic stuff that Tim Ballard has done. But if he had little to no actual involvement in the abduction, um, in the arresting, uh, you know, in the investigation, then, then he's being falsely billed as a hero. Is that yeah. right? Well, well, sure. And, and obviously, you're a bigger hero if you 
uh, arrest somebody that abducts as opposed to someone who grooms because it's just more dramatic because not only is there molestation involved, they're taken completely away from their families. They have no idea uh, what, had, what had happened to them. And, and these are the things that are false. Ballard was not the one who rescued the boy. The boy was not kidnapped, but he was groomed by a, a serial uh, pedophile. Earl Buchanan, you see Buchanan's mugshot uh, there. The boy's sister was not, he had a sister. Uh, she was not kidnapped by anyone. Buchanan uh, had befriended the family, had taken the boy to Mexico, I think, to meet with his father or mother. He was living with his grandmother in near San Bernardino, and they were just coming back. And no girl was sold to a Colombian drug lord. There was no daring rescue that took place of, uh, of any kind. The point here is that the main plot of the movie is that number one, um, the kids are being abducted. Number two, uh, the kids are being trafficked. And number three, the kids are being forced to be sex slaves. Right. And that, uh, you know, and that in reality, none of that happened with the characters depicted in the movie. None of those elements of the story um, are in the real story. So it's a merge. It's not just a merger of stories. It's a, it's a complete fabrication of the story. And Gerardo writes, it's also taking away the focus from the real problem, which is that in the majority of cases, kids are groomed by people known by the family, which exactly. is exactly what happened in the real cases that the movie has contorted. I've done my best to address the point that um, undue attention to dishonest narratives, undue money and time and attention uh, directed at uh, dishonest or unproductive or unhealthy organizations does a disservice to the organizations that need money, that need attention, and that are doing an important job. Um, at helping victims. And the final point I'll make is, um, in my opinion, honesty matters, truth matters. And uh, like the Mormon church and like Joseph Smith, frankly, who um, apparently have dealt in deception of overt knowing deception of members, of leaders, of participants, the ends do not justify the means. Mormon stories, John DeLynn, we do not believe in telling lies, even for a good cause, even if, um, you know, even if it's for a just outcome. We do not believe that it's ethical or moral or good to tell lies, and certainly not to make large amounts of money by whipping up people's emotions in the telling of those lies, even if it's for a good cause. So if I or Mormon Stories or the Obis Stories Foundation have told lies and whipped up emotions, um, I, we want to be called out. We want to be corrected. We want to be held accountable because I will never feel okay about telling lies, whipping up people's emotions to earn money for me or my organization, even if it's for a good cause.